Hello, and welcome to All Our Little Messes, a podcast focused on healing through intentional conversations about parenting, relationships, religion, and more. I am your host, Veronica Winrod, and I'm so happy to have you here, listening in on my thoughts today. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome back to all of our little misses. This is episode nine, and today we'll be continuing our short series on purity culture and the impacts it's had on society. Today, I wanted to talk about the impacts it's had on uh, sex education and how that's affected um, our youth. And I wanted to start off by just briefly touching on the importance of open conversation about sex and anatomy for kids. Um, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware of how today's culture is and how it's affected, you know, Christian sexuality. I mean, we have the effects of, of pornography and, you know, technology has really spread those effects really far, far and wide. Um, and as a result of, you know, technology and uh, pornography and stuff, we also have um, the increased danger of, of our kids potentially being molested. And so, to my mind, that is probably the biggest reason why we need to focus on teaching our kids the correct terms for their anatomy. I have heard way too many stories, and I know way too many people personally, and what I've heard people tell me is just absolutely appalling. Like the names they teach their children to associate with their anatomy and just, instead of just actually calling it by their, you know, their actual correct anatomical terms. And I I mean, I'm sure most of you have heard this story about, you know, the young, the young girl, she was, oh goodness, I think she was in preschool or no, maybe she was old. I think she might have even been as old as um, elementary school age. But anyways, she told this story to her teacher about, you know, how her uncle kept licking her cookie. And the teacher didn't think anything of it and just told the student to, you know, please tell your uncle, don't do that. If you don't like it, just ask him to please stop. And it later came out after a discussion with the girl's mother about how her cookie was itchy that the teacher finally like put two and two together and realized what was going on. But at that point, the abuse had already been happening for months and months and months. And it likely would never have happened in the first place if the student, if the daughter had been taught correct anatomical terms for her anatomy, like if she had been taught boundaries and, you know, this is what it's called, this is what is and isn't allowed to happen there and on and on and on, then like situations like that would never have happened. And so that's like a huge reason why, like, my husband and I chose to teach our kids the names for their anatomy. And I mean, I have, I have a young toddler, um, just over two years old and he knows his, the names for his anatomy. He knows, he knows them all. He's two years old and he, he'll, he'll list them all, you know, my butt, my penis, my testicles. He'll like, he'll list everything down for me. And there is nothing sexual attached to what he's saying because for him, I'm just peeing and I'm pooping and these are my body parts. This is my hand. This is my arm. This is my foot and this is my penis moving on with my life. He doesn't attach any shame to that. And so I feel like it's very important to teach kids early on to 
you know, know the names of their body parts and to not hide them. Because when we hide, and this is something that I, I, it kind of struck me a couple years ago before I even had kids. Um, I was kind of thinking about it and I was like, you know, we don't, we don't hide the names for our arms or our legs or our nose, but we will try to hide the names of our, you know, our, our anatomy and other areas from our kids. And we try to attach shame, like sexual shame to it in a, you know, in a toddler. And that is just so concerning to me because one, you know, we're all made in the image and likeness of God. And in the beginning, there was no shame attached to our bodies. And a little child is, I mean, I feel is as close to that innocence in, you know, the Garden of Eden that we will ever get. And so the first steps that a child takes towards being ashamed of their bodies are the steps we put them out on. So by teaching them, oh, you can't say penis, that's a bad word. Yes, that's attached to that body part, that's a bad word. They're subconsciously going to take the shame attached to that word and attach it to that body part. And there is absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. Zero. The only shame there is, is the shame that we give them. And so it is very important that we, we don't start that cycle with our kids. Because again, it is, it is, we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And he made these parts for a very holy and sacred purpose. And there is no, absolutely zero, absolutely zero shame in that. And we have no right to be starting our kids off on that path. So I, yeah, I teach my kids the names of their, of their body parts and things like that. And, you know, by teaching them the names of their anatomy, like the proper terms and things. I mean, there's like a lot of benefits to that. I mean, you have, of course, you, you can, um, help guard against, not completely, but you can definitely help alleviate concerns when it comes to a potential abuse situation. So if something were to happen, then, you know, your kid will feel like they can actually describe what happened to them instead of my uncle licked my cookie, she would actually be able to say, my uncle touched my vulva or whatever happened. And that would have, I mean, that would have stopped everything right there. If that little girl had known the proper way to describe what had happened, it would have stopped the situation right in its tracks. But instead, she wasn't taught what to say, what her body parts were actually called, and the situation continued on for months. And so the, those conversations are very important because, you know, again, they, it stops, you know, it can stop potential abuse situations from happening. And then, you know, also it kind of opens the door to age-appropriate conversations about sexuality. And I, my oldest is almost five. So I haven't really run into too many conversations in that area. I mean, he's asked, he's asked some questions that, um, I was a little bit, I mean, I wasn't shocked that he asked them because he's, you know, he's a smart five-year-old and he's very observant and there was nothing overtly sexual or anything in the questions he asked. It was, it was, um, you know, about body hair. Why, why is there hair on your legs kind of thing? And the questions just kind of, you know, escalated into, do I, am I going to have hair? Am I going to have hair all over? And then it just, yeah. So, I mean, those, those conversations, like when your, your kid feels comfortable discussing his or her body to their parents, like these kind of, these kinds of conversations that, you know, I had on my couch with my four-year-old, they're very organic. And they just kind of happened naturally. And there was no shame attached. He didn't feel like he was in trouble. He didn't feel like, you know, there was something horrible or bad or anything in the questions he was asking. He just 
genuinely wanted to know. And there was no, I mean, I, I, I experienced this growing up. Like I would ask a question and the automatic response I received was, where did you hear about this? Who told you about this? And at that point I was in my, my mid, my mid teens. And so like, I, in my opinion, I should have already known about these things. Like, these conversations need to be happening by, like, nine years old, in my opinion. By the time you're 15, 16 years old, you should know everything that there is to know. And so, you know, I was asking questions, and the the response was, who told you these things? Who have you been talking to? And so I learned very quickly, <laughs> don't talk about these things. Don't bring anything up. And so... Yeah, it was, it was shameful. You know, these questions were shameful, something to be hidden. I wasn't supposed to ask questions, but at the same time, I was, you know, I was still curious, obviously. So I would learn things from friends and from, you know, books I would find at the library and things like that. And from the internet later on, I would find things from the internet. And so, you know, the and it, it definitely in the beginning it definitely warped my concept of what christian and catholic sexuality was because you know the world tends to portray sex as something um very very transactional and and it's not, it's not a big deal. You can give it to whoever it's, it's no, it's no thing. It's no, it's no problem. And, you know, the statistics show that that is not true. I mean, just the rates in sexual disease and the way, you know, AIDS has skyrocketed through the roof and the rates of, of, you know, children born out of wedlock and, you know, our abortion rates, just very simple things like that show <laughs> that we should not we should not be looking to the internet and things like that for our sex education obviously because again it, it warped my concept of sexuality so that again is a very important reason why we need to start having age appropriate conversations with our kids about their bodies and about sexuality. And it was actually someone um, I know who, you know, mentioned this to me. He said, um, what was it? He said, better a day too early than years too late. And that is very true. Like children's innocence is, is very powerful. And if their minds don't have the ability to absorb information, it tends to just go right over their heads. And so like when you're having a conversation with them and they don't grasp the concept of something, oftentimes it just, you know, they, they may misunderstand it. And that's always a risk that um, you would take and take, you know, giving, having this conversation with them, you know, a day too early. But again, better a day too early than, you know, years too late, because then again, they're going to learn, they're going to learn about, about their bodies. They're going to learn about sex. They're not, I mean, kids are not stupid. They know that something's going on, you know, when they start experiencing puberty and things like that. And so you want them to learn from you and you want them to learn in you know, from a healthy standpoint, you don't want them learning from the internet, which has its own risks. I mean, mo a lot of, a lot of people I know who learned sex education from the internet and from friends later on went on to have uh, pornography addictions. And it's because, you know, when you go to the internet, the first place you're going to find sex education is porn sites. That's, that's just where you're going to learn about sex is porn sites on the internet. And so it's, it's, it's extremely, it's vital. It's absolutely vital and important that we teach our kids at home and we teach them, start teaching them from a young age. And we also impress upon them, you know, the fact that there is nothing shameful 
There is nothing shameful in sexuality. There's nothing that they need to, uh, to hide from themselves or from us. Like if they have a question, encourage them. Tell them, you know, you tell them that it's natural. Tell them that it's healthy that have questions. They're going to be curious. And there's nothing wrong with being curious about their bodies. Their bodies are constantly changing. And they're going to want to know why. And our job is to teach them why. I mean, it even says that in the Bible, to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. Like, raise them up in the way that sh they should go. And so, if we don't do that, then we have failed in our job. And so, again, teach them that there is nothing shameful about their bodies and the natural processes it goes through and encourage them to come to you with questions. And I think one of the first things we can do to kind of help our kids not attach shame to their bodies is, you know, when, when kids are very, very young, and I'm talking like six months to like two years old, during diaper changes, I'm sure like all parents and caregivers have noticed this, kids have a tendency to grab themselves and it is the most annoying thing ever because you're like trying so hard to hurry up, finish that diaper change so, you know, it doesn't get messy. And this little kid is trying to, you know, grab themselves. And I, like when I first, when I first had my, my oldest, I would tell him, oh, don't, we don't touch our wee wees. And my husband heard me after about a month of me doing it. My my son was like seven months old at this point. And he heard me say wee wee and he kind of looked at me funny. He's like, wee wee, where did that come from? <laughs> and I was just like, I don't know what else to call it. And he's like, why don't you just call it a penis? <laughs> and I was just like, but that's weird, babe. We don't say that. That's a weird word. And he just kind of looked at me and he's like, why? Why is it a weird word for you? <laughs> and so... I, I mean, like, I had already kind of thought, like, before I get married, got married, like I mentioned, like, I had already kind of thought about the whole, like, why do we attach so much shame to our bodies? And, like, you know, it's the adults that do that to the kids. These innocent little babies are, are programming. These innocent little babies are being programmed by adults to attach shame to their bodies, often before they can even walk or talk. And it's just, it's horrific. But, like, I'd never... I never thought about like actually teaching my kids, you know, proper anatomical terms because everybody knows what a wee wee is, right? Like it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's a very common, it's a very common term for that. But at the same time, I'm like, I am still in a sense attaching shame to that because I am ashamed and too scared to say the word penis. It's not a bad word. It's not a bad word. It is a body part. Why are we so scared of it? And so I just was like, okay. So it took me, it took me a couple of weeks to finally say the word out loud. Um, I had never said the word. I don't think I'd ever said the word before in my life until that point. And I was, oh goodness, I was like 24 years old. I had never said the word before. And I, I finally said it out loud and I felt so awkward saying it, but he was, I was, again, I was changing his diaper. He was trying to grab himself. And I said, oh no, we don't grab our penis while I'm changing you. We'll get poop everywhere. And that was it. Like, and that was kind of how I introduced the word into like my son's vocabulary. It's, we don't grab our penis while I'm changing diapers. That's, you know, we don't touch that. And so now... My son is very, very comfortable talking about it, like t saying the word, not talking about it, saying the words. And it's actually turned out to be a very good thing because, um, you know, for the health reasons, I mean, he's had, he had a, a health problem just, you know, a couple months ago and he was able to actually come up to me and say, Hey, mommy, my penis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And actually tell me what was going on using actual terms and explaining where it hurt and why it hurt and things like that. And if I hadn't taught him those terms, he wouldn't have been able to describe what was, you know, actually going on. And so, um, also because he's, he's very comfortable with his anatomy too. I mean, I've, and as a result of being a boy mom, you know, you, you come into those, those situations where you, 
all kinds of things happen <laughs> that I won't get into, but I'm sure all boy moms out there can, you know, stand in solidarity with me. <laughs> Boys, am I right? But yes, it's it's a good thing to normalize conversations about your kids' anatomy because they're going to have questions. Why is my body doing this? And even at three, four years old, your kids' bodies are going through huge changes, even even then in those areas. And so you want your kids to to be comfortable coming to you with questions. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Hey, mommy, look what I, you know, look what I can do. Look what just happened. And that's that's good. That's healthy because you need to know at one as their parent what is going on, what is happening. And two, I mean, later in life, if something does happen that is is difficult and and hard to get through for both of you, the fact that you established trust and took away the shame associated with those conversations is going to help you get through those and it's going to make it easier for your child to actually come to you when there's an actual legitimate problem. And that again is like it, I mean, teaching them the correct terms early on in life and just introducing it into, you know, conversations again, while you're like, you're changing them and things like that, or, or bath times or things, or just whenever, you know, it would come up organically, again, is going to also establish trust and communication with your kids. And that would be that that's huge. That's extremely important later on in life when, again, you might have problems, you know, if, if your teenage daughter, you know, happens to to have sex, you know, before marriage or or your son has again, he has sex before marriage or, or anything happens or, or somebody, unfortunately, you know, God forbid, is abused or something happens, then they're going to be they're going to trust you enough to come to you and have those difficult conversations that they might not want to have with anybody else. And they'll also be able to accurately describe what happened to them, which is huge because I personally know teenagers that do not know what their body parts are called. And like when I found out that these kids did not know what their body parts were called, I was shocked. I could not believe that this was even a thing anymore, but um, they didn't, they didn't know. And, uh, it was, it was, it was very strange to me to find that out, but you know, it should be also these conversations that you have with your toddlers about, you know, correct anatomical terms. They generally, they're going to gradually morph into conversations about, about sex. So this is really just like the gateway to that. And it's just a gradual leading up. And um, we're, I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, my husband and I are, are you know, we're still, I, I still consider us infants in our whole parenting journey. So we're still starting out. But we, we definitely want to start teaching our kids from a younger age about you know, about general sex education. When And when Christians think sex education, they think that it means, you know, the nitty gritty of it all. And to me, sex education is so much more than that. It, it is describing puberty. It is describing childbirth. It is describing breastfeeding. It can be describing the postpartum period. I mean, it can be describing child development within the uterus. It can be describing how the uterus works. It can be describing periods. It can be describing the woman's menstrual cycle. It is everything. And there are so many places to start without actually discussing sex. And you can start as young as six years old, in my mind. I mean, because why can't you describe how a baby grows inside of its mother's belly to a six-year-old? Why can't you describe the placenta and the uterus and go through the whole process of childbirth and how sacred and how beautiful it is to a six-year-old? Why can't you describe that? And so... I feel like again, the younger you start, it, it's better to, you know to start a day young, a uh, day too early, than you know years too late. And so, 
it, it's an ongoing process. It's not just a one-time conversation where, you know, you sit your kid down and you just, you know, shove a book at them or you just unload all this information on, you know, your 10-year-old, your 12-year-old, your 14-year-old, however old you end up having this conversation with them and just unload all this information because that in itself can be so traumatizing. Like, again, I know parents that put it off for so long and then they were like, oh, shoot, my daughter's about to go through puberty and they just unloaded all of this information on their daughters. And I, I, goodness, I, I can think of half a dozen girls that this happened to, and they were just absolutely traumatized. I, I had a friend tell me that she cried. And then she told me that it was disgusting. She was 14 at the time when she found out. And she told me that it was disgusting and um, she was never going to do it. And that was actually my initial reaction when I found out. I was like 15 or 16. And I I had to like blatantly ask my mom, is it, <laughs> we had puppies. And I was like, is it like the dogs do it? And when she was like, yeah, sort of, I was like, ew, gross. I'm never going to do that. And cause that was, I had never, I didn't have that gradual introduction into it. And I also didn't have that, that, um, aspect of how beautiful and sacred it is and how it's such a God it's a God-given gift. Our sexuality is a God-given gift. And another thing that, you know, I've, I've discovered and uh, I've been studying my faith more over the past two years and like so many things that I have learned about sexuality within Catholic teaching is just absolutely beautiful. And it is so sad to me that I didn't grow up with this, this introduction to Catholic sexuality. Something that always stuck with me was, um, you know, for the Catholics out there, I'm sure you'll know what I'm talking about. But um, Pope John Paul II wrote this series of letters that were later compiled into a book called Theology of the Body. And within... Uh, when you are reading the theology of the body within like the first chapter or second chapter, somewhere in there, I can't remember. Um, it talks about um, the union between a man and a woman being and, and the fruits of that union being like the fruit of the union between God, the father, God, the son, and, you know, the fruit they produced of their love, God, uh, God, the Holy ghost. And that, just struck me as being so beautiful. And I, I was, I was moved to tears because again, like sex education for me growing up had always been shameful and hidden. And I was always so confused after discussion. And I, I learned about it from, from friends and from the internet and, you know, books at the library. And my, my idea of sexuality was, was warped. And so when I read that and I just, it kind of just, even after being married for a couple of years at that point, it struck me how, how beautiful and sacred it is. And it really is like, you know, when you get married, you, you take a vow of, of commitment and love and, you know, to honor and respect your spouse till death do you part. And like every time in, in within Catholic teaching, it's actually, it's, it, it's a general belief that every time you engage in the sexual union with your spouse, you are, you are sacramentally renewing those vows to your spouse every time. And so to read that in theology of the body, like that our union mirrored the union between God the Father and God the Holy Ghost, God the Father and God the Son was just, it was beautiful. It was so moving. And I'd never thought of sexuality in that way before. And so that's, that's another reason why like these, these ongoing conversations with your child are so important because you can introduce that kind of thing to them. You can show them how beautiful and how sacred sex should be. And that there's, there's nothing to be ashamed in it. There's nothing to be ashamed in, in our sexual natures. They're, they're a God given gift. I mean, the whole point of our sexual natures is to, you know, is one union with our spouses within the concept, context of marriage. That is the primary purpose of, of sex. And the secondary purpose was, um, procreation of children. And so like having those conversations and helping them to understand how beautiful and sacred it is and that that it's 
something to be cherished and not something just to be, for one, not something to be thrown away, but also not something to be ashamed of. There's no, there's no shame in our sexuality. It is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us. And it's something that we should treasure and be proud of. Honestly, we should be proud of it and we should guard it. And, you know, this whole culture in, in a lot of Christian and Catholic circles now of, of, you know, hiding our sexuality and, and guarding it as like a shameful secret that we don't talk to our kids about, because if we talk to our kids about it, then they're going to want to go have sex is, is crazy. It's crazy. If we introduce our kids to sex early on as something beautiful and sacred and holy and a God given gift, why, why is that considered dangerous? And, and I don't understand why parents would see it that way. Like kids are not going to just run off and go have sex because you had the sex talk with them. Hiding it from them is going to make them curious and then they're going to go run off and do it because they're going to want to know what it's all about. If you introduce it to them at home in a safe setting, you tell them what's going on, you show them how sacred it is, you you teach them a biblical foundation for sexuality, they're not going to run off and, you know, go have sex because their, their curiosity will have already been satisfied, essentially, within the safe context of your home and within the same context of your faith and the Bible. It's not going to be a problem. And if it is a problem, then Again, you need to be that that safe place and that place where they can communicate to you about what happened and a place where they can land after, you know, after their mistake. Then we shouldn't we shouldn't shame them for that mistake, because trust me, they're already going to be ashamed enough. Like they don't need more shame. We need to help them get through that and, you know, show them, you know, the love and forgiveness that. Jesus gave to sexual sinners within the Bible. You know, the woman at the well, Mary Magdalene, he did not shame them for their sexual sin. He said to give up your sin and follow me. And that is something that we need to bottle for our kids if, you know, all else fails and they do, they do fall. So that is, that is something that I feel like we should, we should definitely try to, try to focus on. And, I mean, I, I personally don't have any resources. I'm still trying to compile a list of, of resources for parents or honestly, just for myself. I have a couple of books that I'm going through reading right now. I have heard kind of iffy things about some of the, the, um, the books that I'm, I'm looking at purchasing. And one of the books in particular, I forget the name of the series. I'm going to see if I can pull it up for you guys. Um, but I know another series was, that I'm, I'm definitely interested in reading. And if any of you have already read this book or this series of books, then please let me know how you liked it. But it was a series of books written by Luke and Trisha Gilkerson. I guess Luke Gilkerson used to work for um, Covenant Eyes, which is the, the internet filter that is very commonly used in Christian and Catholic circles, but um, it's a three-part. It's a, uh, a three-part series. Um, he has a book uh, called "The Talk: Seven Lessons to Introduce Your Child to Biblical Sexuality." He has a book called "The Talk Changes," which is seven biblical lessons to make sense of purity, and then he also has one on relationships, 11 lessons to give kids a greater understanding of biblical sexuality. So if any of you actually have read that, then please let me know. You can either email me, um, I believe on Apple or Spotify, you can actually leave a comment on um, the the episode. And yeah, please let me know if, if you've read these books and if you liked them. There's also another series of books called um, God's Design for Sex. Now this one I was a little iffy about. Um, I ordered it. I haven't started reading it, but it's a six-part 
series of books starting at the age of three years old, going through the uh, going through the ages of 16. And I guess it's supposed to, it covers everything. Um, uh, it even, it even goes into, I guess their updated versions, their updated editions actually also cover, um, same sex marriage and, uh, sexual diseases and things like that within the context of, of the Bible. So, um, I have heard some rather iffy things about that. Um, I had one parent tell me that they read, I believe it was book number four, and they were talking about, um, you know, the risks of having, of having sex before marriage. And one of the, the things that the author suggested was that if they did have uh, you know, a baby before marriage, then they were going to be abandoned by all their friends and they were going to live a life of poverty and the dad was going to abandon them and life was, you know, going to suck. They were never going to find a good husband. And um, she was really bothered by that, understandably. And, you know, basically saying, because you've had this kid, your life is over. And which is so damaging, not only to the mother, but also to the baby to attach all of this blame onto the baby. If only I didn't have you, then my life wouldn't suck. And that's just, that's just so sad to, to do that. So yeah, there were some things in those books she didn't like. That was just one of them. So again, it's a six part series of books. So it's going to take me a while. I guess four or five of the books are, um, for the kids to read along with the parents. And then one of the books is a parent's guide to the series on basically just how to get through the series. So um, those are two, two series of books I've been personally looking into. Again, I'm reading, I'm reading the um, uh, God's Design for Sex series. And um, if it's any good, I, I'll, I'll probably um, do a blog review, a blog post review, and post that for you guys to look at. But um, yeah, those are the two, those are the two books, the two series that I'm I'm currently looking into for sex education for my kids. Thank you very much for listening to this episode on uh, sex education within the context of purity culture. Um, just a couple of key takeaways for all of you listeners today. I would really encourage um, you guys to really um, take action in, you know, promoting age appropriate sex education and and, you know, teaching your kids proper anatomical terms and really, you know, studying. And if you have a hard time with, you know, calling a body part by, you know, it's, it's, it's name really examining within yourselves why you have such a hard time, you know, attaching that name to that body part and why it's such a problem for you. I mean, cause a lot of us, we attach shame to different things for different reasons, stemming from our childhood, from trauma, or, you know, for, we honestly would have no reason why. So I would definitely try to, um, I would definitely encourage parents and, you know, and educators and caregivers to really examine the reasons why they would not want to, you know, attach proper terms to their anatomy and to not teach kids about, about sex until, you know, basically until it's too late, which is, it's becoming an epidemic in Christian circles. I mean, I, I know way too many, like I mentioned before, I know way too many teenage girls that know nothing about sex. I personally know of a, a girl who did not know about sex until the night before she got married. And I cannot even imagine how traumatizing that must have been for her. So, um, yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely, uh, encourage parents to, to reexamine those beliefs if they have them. And then also to, to look into different you know, books and, you know, organizations that can, that can help support you in, you know, having biblical, biblically based conversations with your kids and, you know, books and, you know, 
organizations, websites that can, you know, guide you in that process because it is very difficult. I, I know, I mean, just from personal experience, it's very difficult to have those conversations, especially when you haven't even really thought of or been used to, um, you know, having to have those conversations or thought that it would never happen or you would never have to get, you know, explicit because it wasn't something you should do. We like, we shouldn't be explicit with our kids kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely encourage you to, you know, look up resources. And, um, as I, as I get more resources and, uh, more books and things together. I will, I will actually be writing a blog post for that. And, um, if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, um, I post about two to three blog posts per week on, on different subjects. And so if you follow me, um, you'll be sure to get that blog post posted on one of those two places. So, um, yeah, just, just let's keep an eye out for that. But anyways, thank you guys very much for listening to this episode and I will see you guys all next week. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of All Our Little Messes. Please let us know how much you enjoyed it below and add any questions you have about this episode. Also, don't forget to follow us on Patreon for amazing exclusive perks, including early access to podcast episodes and bonus episodes every month. We've also recently added a support group for all of our paid patrons. You can check us out on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates and insights that mirror podcast topics. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.